Good morning and, and welcome to the 12th meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Good to see you all here. Our only item on the agenda this morning is to take evidence on the, in a, this round table format on the additional dwelling supplement. I warmly welcome all our witnesses to the meeting. And this round table format is intended to create as much free flow of discussion as we can achieve. But if you want to contribute, try to catch my eye or the clerk's eye and we'll do our best to get you in at the right time. Um, we're going to have this discussion based around four themes and each a, a separate member will kick off the, the different themes to get us into the, the process. Now, inevitably, we might be cutting across these themes as we go through the process and it might, we might have to change the format as we go along. That's the nature of a, flow, a free flowing discussion after all. So, to begin, um, we will consider the first theme on how ADS has been operating in practice, and I'm going to ask James Kelly to start off that discussion. Thank you, James. Okay, uh, thanks a lot, convener, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for your attendance this morning. I think it's very helpful that we've got a wide-ranging panel. We've got representatives that are, you know, in charge, essentially, of implementing the technical aspects of an additional dwelling supplement, and others who represent individuals and groups who... Uh, are at the sharp end of that operation and have expressed strong views uh, on uh, on its operation. So just to kind of set the context for this morning's session and to get the discussion going, we're interested in people's views and experiences of how the implementation of an additional dwelling supplement has actually operated in practice. So who'd like to kick off for, for 10? On you go. Well, um, good morning, convener. Thank good morning, you, Lily. Introduce myself. I'm Elaine Lorimer, and I'm the Chief Executive of Revenue Scotland, the tax authority charged with the operation and administration of, of LBTT and additional dwelling supplement. So there's maybe one or two things that might be useful just to set the scene for, for the discussion. I think the first point that I'd really like to make to the committee is, of course, um, ADS, if we can call it that, um, is quite a different tax to LBTT. Although they're both taxes on land transactions, uh, what brings the complexity to additional dwelling supplement is that we need to look to the personal circumstances of the taxpayer as to whether they're entitled to the repayment of the tax <coughs> or not. Um, and so that brings considerable complexity, I think, in terms of the understanding by taxpayers of whether they have to comply with the payment or not. Um, and from us, from an operational perspective, it meant, of course, that we then had to introduce significant uh, new guidance um, on our website. And it, just to give you an example, we've got over 75 worked examples on our website in relation to additional dwelling supplement. Um, and of course, that tries to be comprehensive, but it can't possibly cover every set of circumstances. <coughs> from an operational perspective, um, ADS accounts for around 24% of the incoming calls to our support desk, mostly from taxpayers uh, wanting to know whether the, the uh, tax applies to them or not. Um, and in terms of um, the revenues that are uh, generated, um, around 25% uh, of the transactions that comes into us for ADS, the, the taxpayers saying that they, they intend to reclaim. However, in practice, that's working out at around uh, 15 to 20%. So there's a small percentage of people who initially think they might be reclaiming and then they don't follow through in that. And there could be an, any number of reasons as to why that might be the case. You'll also see from the evidence that we put forward to you that around 25 to 30% of the revenues that we bring in from ADS are then subsequently repaid. And there's a time lag that's associated with that because taxpayers have 18 months to dispose of their dwelling um, to be entitled to the repayment and then they have five years within which to, recl to reclaim it. So you'll see from the table that we uh, uh, submitted as part of our evidence that tries to show you the committee the time lag in terms of repayments. And that was all I was going to say by way of introduction, uh, okay. convener, if that's helpful. That is helpful. It sets some of the context then, and um, I'm sure that some people want to the chance to do as well. Um, Isabel de Murnau, um, Law Society of Scotland Tax Committee. Um, in relation to the introduction of ADS, as I'm sure everybody knows, it had to be brought in in a very short time scale. And that's result. And as uh, Elaine has explained, it's a very complicated tax. So 
there have been quite a few things that have turned out to be not quite as perhaps people had intended. It sounds very easy to have a tax on second homes, but firstly, that's not what it is. It's not always on second homes. Sometimes it can be on your first home. And uh, the, the, the complexities for individuals are quite mind-boggling. So we've had one change, um, which um, everyone, I'm sure, is aware of, to fix an issue which um, did seem to be extremely unfair. But there are a number of others. I mean, even in that relief that was introduced, and uh, Murdo had a, a, a great deal of input in, in getting that through, it only addresses some of the difficult problems. So it addresses couples living together where only one of them owns the house and buying a new one in joint names, which is great. But it doesn't address, address couples planning to get married and not living together before they get married and wanting to buy a house in joint names and selling a, um, a house that only one of them owns. Or equally, it doesn't address people living together but in the wrong house as it were. So they live together, but instead of living in the house that they're going to sell, they live in the other house. So you know, there's those kind of issues um, were, couldn't have been foreseen when the legislation was being drafted and now need to be fixed. And there are other difficult areas, such as divorcing couples, which we feel quite strongly about, where although the ADS legislation kind of doesn't treat them as a unit anymore, in general, people who are married or in a long-term relationship um, tend to own property in joint names, and that joint name is in <coughs> continues, so they get clobbered for ADS uh, if one of them departs and has to buy a new residence. So all of these things are um, areas which probably need to be addressed to make it fairer um, and weren't able to be addressed in the short time scale when the relief was... was sorry, when the... Firstly, the legislation, then the relief was coming in. So we think there are quite a lot of areas which need to be changed to make it operate as, you know, the government probably intended. Yeah, can I ask a question on that just now? Because you, 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 the Law Society submitted a very useful paper that yes. outlined a number of the areas. It was very helpful in that regard. Um, but it did, and, and there's quite a number of areas which yes. you've outlined. It, it did begin to raise the question in my own head that, that every time you try to tr change tax le legislation, it can create loopholes for other people to, to be in, in, involved in if we're not very careful in how it, mm -hmm. and, and how it, it's drafted. And the, the issue of, of the amount of, and this maybe sounds a bit blunt to those who are, who are affected yeah. by that, but the amount of effort having to be put in to change that legislation um, for the small amount of people who are affected is that really an efficient way to go about it in terms of dealing with the, the specifics on EDS? I just, it's a question I've got in my head, and it might be that we've got to do these sort of things, but is it the right way to be, be approaching it? Um, I think our response to that would be that <clears throat> the way we fixed the first problem did Im involve a great deal of effort, and it involved a, a sort of one-trick pony type of ADS bill. But that's not the best way of dealing with it. The, the, the better way of dealing with it might be to collect these points together and have a, a mechanism for dealing with them, perhaps on an annual basis through a finance bill type of arrangement, which would have involved a lot less effort per change, as it were. So, you know, when we heard there was to be an ADS bill, we, we were delighted and thought, oh, well, we can add all of these things in, but in fact had a very narrow scope. So that's... That's not really the best way of dealing with it. But it's perhaps all about collecting the right amount of tax, isn't it? Rather than being um, put off by the difficulties of changing the legislation. It, it doesn't seem right for the tax system to be discriminating against couples who are separating. It's difficult enough anyway. And most of the time, the tax legislation tries to be helpful. So it's, it's kind of a deserving case, but but not if we have to go through the process of having a, another act for each. I mean, that would, I think, I don't know how many points we've mentioned, but if we were to do it in the, on the same basis as up to now, that's about eight ADS acts, which is yeah. not okay. ideal. That's helpful. Charlotte. Your point about Maybe banking. just explain who you are. Oh, at the sorry. Of Charlotte. I'm sorry, Charlotte Barber, Institute of Chartered Accountants of Scotland. I'm director of tax there. Uh, 
your question about boundaries is interesting uh, because wherever you have a tax, you're always going to have boundaries. And I think one of the difficulties with ADS is what Elaine was talking about. You've got two types of boundaries. One, you've got a tax on transactions, and then you've got a tax on people's circumstances, and those two don't fit easily, and they're never going to fit easily, and you're always going to have boundary issues no matter what you do. But where I think ICAS might come from is now that we have devolved taxes in place and they've been up and running for a number of years, we were, we were very supportive of the projects that are on hand at the moment to look at maybe bringing more process in so that there's better policy consideration as to exactly what you want to tax and then there's better consultation around the draft legislation so that it actually does what you want it to do and thereafter some kind of regular process to bring these points up. Tax is living, it's always changing. We'll be here, always. I guess, I guess that the point there is that there's a trade-off between the drafting of tax, tax legislation and anticipating any anomalies that might arise in, in, in these circumstances. It's going to be impossible to do it, and perhaps some of the mechanisms mm -hmm. you described might be one way to do it. Elaine, again. Obviously, from our perspective as the, as the tax authority, how you then operationalise that um, also needs to be taken into account. But um, and and well, <coughs> we would want to be uh, for the taxes for the for it to be efficient in the way in which we're able to con to collect it, and and also from our experience, being able to have such clearly defined legislation that it purely just captures the issues that of policy that um, are at play is an incredibly difficult task. Incredibly difficult task to do. Sorry, can I, can just yeah. just add a small point that. One of the reasons for trying to make these changes that we've suggested is that it might do away with some of the phone calls to Elaine's uh, people trying to say, why on earth, you know, surely it can't apply to me if the legislation is fixed so that in these cases where it seems absolutely counterintuitive and daft, you know, that, that's, the, that's the sort of benefit of it on the operational front. David. Um. David Milhewish, uh, Scottish Property Federation. Um, I think just a couple of points uh, to support, I think, the views which uh, have been expressed and, and a question, really. I mean, the question I'll just put out there, if the tax is, I think we'd estimated about 25% on an annual tax year basis being repaid, if it's a bit more than that, 25 to 30%, um, my question is, is, is that therefore an efficient tax if, if you're having that amount of repayment over, over a period of time? Um, but the points as well made... I think we would support the, the notion that some sort of annual finance bill is going to be necessary because the fact is that society and personal circumstances change. And I think the Law Society's paper also made the point that people, perhaps unsuspectingly, were eligible for ADS if they'd happened to inherit a share of a tax. And in, a, in an era where the older generations are, are, are going to be uh, hopefully devolving down uh, properties to the next generations, which perhaps I haven't yet got onto the property ladder, then I think that might become a more complicated situation as we go forward. I think an annual finance bill is going to be needed to sort of address those issues as they become more commonplace, as well as the demographics that we have of I mean, granny flats and so on was also mentioned in the Law Society's paper as well. And I, I don't think any of that was envisaged in the sort of six-week process we had to introduce this act in the first place. Although it was a six-week process, it did go through the, the normal legislative cycle yes, in Parliament, and obviously there were, that was a, it was a reaction to what was happening with, uh, with what the UK government had done in terms of their, their positioning, so Scotland did to react to that. Murdo. Yes, thanks, Convener. <coughs> Just before asking my question, I should remind uh, colleagues of my register of interests in relation to my personal property interests, and also I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland. Um, and I just wanted to follow up this point about the, the, the unintended consequences that Isabel Dunverno referred to and the various examples that have been worked out. And we've had um, individuals approach uh, the committee to highlight some of these concerns, particularly this issue where uh, two people who are uh, not currently living together, one has property, one doesn't, who then buy a joint property and cannot reclaim ADS. And it seems that it doesn't comply at least with the spirit of the legislation. But the question I really wanted to ask Elaine was, how many how many people get caught out by this, not you know, who, who expect that they'll be able to reclaim ADS, and then find themselves in a situation where they've taken a, a decision to buy a property, and then suddenly realise too late that they can't reclaim it, or 
do you think everybody is sufficiently forearmed in advance of that? Because that's because if if, if, there, if there's quite a group of people, and we have at least one example of this, who are inadvertently finding themselves caught by this tax because they're not sufficiently aware of the consequences of their actions, I think that's quite a serious issue. So, um, I can't. I don't have that. Uh, statistic in front of me, and I'm not sure we would we would have that information. Um, but what I would say is, um, obviously, this comes down to taxpayers yeah. being aware of um, the application of the legislation to their particular transaction, and the actions that we've taken in relation to that has been really close working with the Law Society, uh, with ICAS, with professional advisors. Um, with the information that we've got on our website, with our seventy odd worked examples, um, so I but so I, I don't know whether people are are being caught out in the way that you're describing, where they're finding they've got to pay ADS when they didn't think. I'm sorry, I can't I can't give you that information. I don't know if either Charlotte or Isabel. Do you, sorry. Yeah. Last point. The only other thought I have, though, is that we were, as I said at, just at the very beginning, we do know that there is a small percentage of people who tick the box to say that they wish to reclaim and then they don't end up reclaiming. Now, we don't know the reasons for that. We think some of that might be to do with compliance work we've done. Um, mm. But it may also be, it may be that some of that percentage are people who recognise that ADS applies, think they might be able to reclaim it, and then they're finding out that they're not able to. This is completely anecdotal, but one of the things I find quite interesting amongst our membership, uh, I think traditionally uh, accountants would have left SDLT to lawyers as a property tax, but when I'm out and about these days, I find that, I mean, not all by any manner of means, but certainly more than I would expect of our members are being asked about, well, LBTT, not necessarily ADS, but LBTT, I think it's considered to be quite expensive uh, and I think it's also considered to be a bit of a risk uh, and, and compliance needs to be checked. It maybe needs more than just conveyancing lawyers. Is it all? Yeah, um, I think <coughs> I would echo that, that for a conveyancing solicitor who is being paid to uh, buy or sell a house, having to deal with the complexities of ADS is quite a heavy burden and so um, obviously, large firms have tax departments, um, but smaller firms don't have that luxury. And um, so some solicitors are saying, sorry, we this is too, too difficult and too risky for us. You'll need to ask for your accountant. So that, in a way, is a bit of a sorry state of affairs if you can't buy a house without asking an accountant about how much uh, you have to pay, with all due respect to... Accountants. <laughs> but it means that the normal member of the public can't sort of look at the 75 examples on Revenue Scotland's website and think, aha, I know exactly what the position is. Um, so lots of them phone up and say, well, you know, what, what's the story for me? Um, but I think anecdotally, our members certainly have many, many examples of people assuming that they won't have to pay ADS. But in fact, it turns out when you look at the facts that they do. Um, many firms have a questionnaire of, of, um, that they give to clients to establish the facts that might lead to whether the ADS is payable or not. Um, but I guess in terms of trying to make this tax operate better, what we need to do, if we can, is look at those areas where people, taxpayers say, you have to be joking, surely that doesn't apply in my circumstances, and see if those could be fixed. Like, you know, the people not living together. Surely the Scottish Parliament doesn't mean that I have to live with my whoever before I get married in order to be able to not pay the ADS. Surely that cannot be the case. Or, you know... Surely, why, why does it matter which house we live in? You know, we're a couple, we're selling one, buying another. Why should that matter? Joe, did I catch your eye there? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe Joyce, I'm here on behalf of SEOT, but um, I'm a senior member in um, KPMD Stamp Taxes team, and I just wanted to um, echo really what Isabel and Charlotte have said. <clears throat> Prior to the introduction of the ADS, we didn't really see a lot of queries coming through on straightforward residential um, purchases. And now, say, I get... Probably about 25% of the queries I get is around people buying houses or 
particularly buying um, with their children or with their parents, um, the issues around divorce and couples who aren't married again or aren't living together beforehand. And historically, these had generally been dealt with by convincing solicitors because it wasn't really, your personal circumstances weren't really that relevant. Um, so it is um, putting a lot more burden on both the tax taxpayers and the um, convincing profession to trying to get to the bottom of what what tax people should be paying. I think, I mean, people do want to be paying the right amount of tax. It's just sometimes they don't know what that is. And um, as Isabel said, I think fixing some of these problems will really help because a lot of the time you look at what the legislation was meant to do and try and, if you're coming at it from a lay person's point of view, think, well, should I be in it? So it can be a big shock when you suddenly find out you've got an extra 4% of, to pay. It's quite a chunky number and it is, you know, it's cash outright. So, Ross? Um, Ross Matthew from Hayden Developments in St Andrews. We are um, house builders there, and I'm here um, representing the company, but uh, also from the perspective of the small and medium um, house builders and how LBTT and ADS uh, applies. Um, I did submit a, a brief report. I'm not sure how far it's been circulated, but if you're happy, I can read through. You, 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 you did all get it. Pick out the main stuff. We all mean yeah, yeah. Well, the main, the main, the main point, I suppose, from that report is that, um, from a small house builder point of view, um, if we if we purchase a, a site which has a house on it, which is going to be demolished, and there's planning consent in place to to um, redevelop that site and improve that site, and 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 um, provide energy efficient modern um, homes. We are um, prejudiced, really, uh, through the system because when we purchase a site, we pay the LBTT and also the ADS for a house that's just going to be demolished. So, you know, if, if we, from, from a larger house builder point of view or from a greenfield site um, perspective, if, if that site was purchased and there was no house there, the commercial LBTT would apply. So it's almost like a... A, a double whammy there, where where we have the the, the LBTT plus ADS um, and not the commercial rate. I did submit some a couple of tables there with the report just to try and illustrate where yes, if we were purchasing a brownfield site, a small site, then um, the, the 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 tax take for the the government uh, would be more on the um, on the LBTT plus ADS than it would be on the commercial side. But looking at the full picture, if that site was purchased on a commercial basis, new um, houses were, were, were built there, then the, the, the tax take is going to be increased because um, there's also going to be the LBTT on the new house sales. So comparing it just from a purely tax take, you know, that, 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 would, that would result in a, a positive um, a positive tax um, take. Uh, but the, the, bigger, the bigger picture really is that um, you know, we're trying to, uh, from a, on a small builder anyway, trying to purchase smaller brownfield sites, redevelop them, uh, improve them, create um, energy efficient homes um, and being prejudiced or, or penalised because of that. And we feel that really if you, if, if you can demonstrate that your site is, is has planning consent, has proper planning consent to redevelop it and improve it, then that penalty um, shouldn't be there. It's not an additional dwelling, really. It's, it's bought purely as a as a, a development site. But the consequence, maybe an unintended consequence, is the EDS comes into force just because of the way the rules are at present. Alexander, is it on the same point? Is yes. It? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, convener, uh, and uh, also note my interest uh, in a uh, SME house builder. Um, you know, what you've been covering there was you know, one of the unintended consequences of, of not being able to get into brownfield sites uh, to develop them. But you know, I think there's a wider issue as well uh, in terms of the multiplier effect of actually you know, house sales not happening. You know, you know, I hear from other house builders on a weekly basis of sales not happening because of the, these two these two taxes. I just wondered if yourself or, or any other, other panel uh, could comment on that. Um, 
Yes, from our point of view, we, 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 we had a, a site, a small site um, here in Edinburgh and um, uh, had a, a, a reservation in place. Um, why, why, why the party didn't quite realise at the time there was going to be a, an ADS payment, I'm not quite sure, but um, when they did, the house sale fell through. Um, that's one on a, on, a, on a small site, but I dare say if you multiply that up to larger developers, then it will, um, it will be a significant number. Let's try and dig down on that a bit then. Can we just see just how real this is? Um, and uh, does any other people involved in the house building sector want to can say something about that at this stage as well? Like SPF, we do, we do have members in that sector too. And yes, it adds a complication to tax. And the point is as well, it's, this is a slab tax, so it's different to, to where we went to originally with, um, with LBTT, which was broadly supported. So proportionately, because it's on the whole consideration, uh, it, it's a much greater charge uh, than would normally be the case on, on the on the usual uh, residential LBTT scales, which, as was pointed out by Ross, are, are actually higher than the commercial ones as well. So. But can we get underneath it a bit and give me some real numbers and some evidence? I've, I've heard about one site. How, how big a problem actually is this? And how many sites are actually being prohibited from proceeding? And I, I, I hear the general message, but I yeah. think... It would be good to understand a bit more about what the actual impact is. Uh, I, I mean, we'd have to survey that specific point and come back to you. I won't want to comment on it with, okay. without doing that. <clears throat> Ross, can you give us a bit more detail? <laughs> as far as numbers, possibly not. But there are other consequences as well, as far as if, if sites don't progress because of this, there's also the, the affordable housing provision as well. Because if a site did, did progress... Um, and was 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 held back because of LBTT and, and ADS. If that did if that did um, um, progress, then out of the new houses that are being built on that brownfield site, the likelihood is that a proportion of these will be affordable homes. So there's a loss there's a loss of affordable homes that, as well. I think we accept the general issues. But I'm looking for scale. information, scale, numbers, and so we so as a committee we need evidence. And I've heard about one site so far. And I've heard about general issues, but I, haven't heard, I, I think we need a bit more, as, as David has suggested, to get underneath that. Um, I've got one Elaine. statistic that might might be useful to okay. this discussion, and that is the number of notifiable transactions that we have received since um, ADS was introduced, and um, and that is that we, you know, there hasn't been a drop in notifiable property transactions since ADS has been introduced it's averaging around 103,000 a year property transactions. Okay, Ross? I think one of my main points here is that um, we feel it's prejudicial to the small and medium house builder. I know it's not just all about house builders and scales of house builders, but it's prejudicial. There may be, there may be numbers and there may be numbers of house sales, but we feel it's most definitely um, holding back um, or prejudicial to the small and medium house builder who are looking to typically um, take on the smaller sites, brownfield sites, improve them, and that's where the that's where the the, the, the problem for us is, okay. is arising. Okay. Um, does anybody else want to contribute to, to this bit of the discussion, or we'll, we'll move on to the next bit? Some of which have maybe already overtaken, Murdo. I think we probably covered it. To well, be honest, though. can I just on on the back of what would have been your question? Then, can I ask what people mean then? By a finance bill, yeah. because uh, uh, that's uh, is that a care and maintenance bill we're talking about, or is it a finance bill? So to, to deal with all these unintended consequences sweeping up. Um, well, it doesn't matter what it's called. Um, we, I think, are referring it to a, to it as a finance bill because we're tax people and we're accustomed to the Westminster Finance Bill, the main purpose of which is to make changes to the tax legislation. So I think what we're talking about is a something which makes changes to the tax legislation, some of which could be care and maintenance, but some of which could be, you know, changes which go further than that and are actually policy changes. It really matters on Julie what you call it, but I think what we do need is a process which is regular. And of course, the other debates we've had is whether 
a finance bill has a kind of annual connotation to it, doesn't it? Uh, and whether you want it annual or, or once every two years it is currently being discussed in some of the, the in the policy consultation and also in the working group. Uh, the jury's out on whether you want it every single year, but you do need something regular so that, that there's always a, an allocated space to pick up the kind of issues, and some of them are care and maintenance, some of them might be new taxes, some of them might be a review of ADS, for instance, or a review of penalties. Okay, is there not a tension there, there and this, uh, doing it this way, between the need to have scrutiny and also the speed that would be required to put these tax changes in and that sort of bill, uh, and the consultation that might be required beforehand, and again, unintended consequences coming about if we've got a, either an annual or a biannual process, and, and making sure that we're able to scrutiny, because this committee would probably be where it would, where it would land, and if there are you know, potentially a dozen changes, two dozen changes, who knows how many changes this bill will be, because it wouldn't just be for this particular ADS. How do we make sure that's all been scrutinised properly and the proper consultation has been undertaken? I'm, I'm asking, I'm, these are, you know, double questions I'm asking, but I'm doing it intentionally. That's yeah. part of the, the discussions that are taking place around the policy consultation that the Scottish Government is running at the moment, uh, and there's also work on that elsewhere. But I think if you had an annual process or a regular process, part of what you'd build in is where you'd, you'd slot in your consultation. And I'm not sure that you have to have tax measures brought in really quickly. I mean, all these ADS issues that we're talking about are not being dealt with at the moment. So whether it was in one year's time or two years' time, that would be better than just not doing it. Uh, and also, if you have better consultation up front for new measures coming in, you'd like to think we might manage to tackle some of these issues before they get there. Thank you. Willie? Thanks, I'm convener. on the record. I want on the record, so it's right. important. So thank you. Thanks, convener. I just wanted to ask if we could put a possible figure on the scale of these anomalies at the, you know, the edges of the policy here. Elaine, I think you just said there there's been 103,000 transactions and that hasn't... That is not a drop since ADS came in. And Isabel, you were describing some examples where there were some ridiculous scenarios emerging, yeah. but what's the scale of it? I mean, I've not had any, I've had two inquiries in ADS to my, in my constituency office out of 61,000 <laughs> constituents. It, it, it's not a lot, but I'd like to get some kind of flavour from you about what the scale you think it is. I think perhaps some of the figures that Elaine was um, mentioning earlier about the number of inquiries to Revenue Scotland that 25% or something like that was uh, in relation to ADS. So um, perhaps the point is that uh, the, the, the tax system is creaking a bit. And it's the same, the same issues arise in relation to SDLT, of course, um, that w be partly because of uh, some of the anomalies, partly because of the nature of the tax itself it sounds like a good idea to tax second homes but in reality it's a lot more difficult than that um but it it's, it places a strain on the resources of the tax authority dealing with so many queries not just from agents as well but also from members of the public and for members of the public it gives them a bit of a bad taste in the mouth if firstly they can't figure out what the situation is that applies to them and secondly um if, if they need to go to the tax authority and all the rest of it. So I, I think that's the context in which we have to look at it. Um, but as Charlotte says, it doesn't need to be done hurriedly. So the process could span over a couple of years. I, I, I guess the question of whether you have an annual finance type bill or a biannual one is, you know, that's another discussion. But if there were a regular vehicle onto which these things could be put, that would be the helpful thing, rather than having to get agreement to have a particular bit of legislation and so on. It's trying to have a regular process, and that would help everybody involved in it, because people would know if you want to make a fuss about, you know, the ADS charge for developers buying land, which is effectively, you know, th that would be the time to make the, the point and fit it in. And if much of the sort of consultation and... or scrutiny and so on, not by the Parliament, but by stakeholders could be done in advance. When it came to the parliamentary scrutiny, hopefully it would be in a better state and, you know, the 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 measures would be better thought through. I, know, I think Tony's working on as well, but Willie? 
in that about the, the 24 per cent calls that, that Elaine's department's receiving, they're not surely all anomalous situations that would require resolution through a policy change, are they? All of them? No. That's, that, you're, you're absolutely right about that. So the, the, I don't have figures in front of me in terms of the breakdown of the type of inquiry, but I know anecdotally that the vast majority of the inquiries we're getting are straightforward DDS inquiries. They're not the, the um, quite technical, uh, detailed issues that the Law Society have presented to us. I, I'm not saying these aren't issues that they've presented to us, but they're by no means uh, uh, regular occurrences for my support desk or my uh, mailbox inquiry team to have to deal with. Tony, am I right? You, you wanted to... Uh, I, I wasn't sure. We were moving on to the next part of the conversation, but... Uh, well, let's just do that. Unintended consequences, but, but just, just to comment on some of, of that wider conversation. I'm, uh, so my my name is Tony Kane. I work for the Association of Local Authority Chief Housing Officers, so my background is in uh, public sector housing. I don't think our members are seeing any evidence of smaller sites being sterilised as a consequence of, of ADS, but we would be concerned if there was any real evidence that small and medium-sized uh, builders were struggling in the market, because it's a big gap in the structure of the house building industry in Scotland, and there is there are all sorts of conversations about how you encourage in development. So if the tax is is obstructed, I, I haven't seen any evidence, but if it is, then we, we would also be concerned about that because of the impact it would have on the overall shape of the, the construction sector. Our particular interest at this stage in the conversation, before we get to the kind of strategic and market impacts, is, is a simple piece of special pleading, but in my defence, it's the same piece of special pleading I've been making for the last uh, uh, two or three years, which is that this tax applies to local authorities. I do not think it was intended to apply to local authorities. Um, it is costing the sector significant amounts of money. Local authorities are now very active in the process of, of acquiring individual properties to support um, strategic uh, and operational housing objectives. Uh, and I provided a paper, my apologies, it was late yesterday, based on a limited survey of, of our members, which gives a, uh, an idea of the scale of activity and the scale of cost. So uh, that paper, I think, identifies, give figures from eight local authorities who over the last three years have acquired close to 1,100 uh, properties in the open market uh, and spent something over a couple of million pounds on, on ADS. There is also behind that a substantial expenditure on LBTT, in the acquisition of sites and properties for the affordable housing supply program, which councils pay and housing associations do not because they do have an exemption as charities. There isn't an exemption for local authorities, despite, I think, some of the uh, lack of clarity on that in the uh, local government and community committees report from, from a couple of years ago. Uh, and our concern is that the financial impact of this is actually reducing the effectiveness uh, and the, the, the impact of the overall affordable housing supply program. It may also, on some occasions, result in transactions under the government's um, mortgage to rent scheme, the homeowner support scheme, not proceeding because the overall cost of the transaction with uh, ADS but becomes unviable within the terms of that scheme, or just too expensive for the authority to proceed with. So our concern is that one of the unintended consequences here is councils are paying this, they're paying quite a lot, and it is constraining their ability to meet both local strategic and operational objectives and deliver the Scottish Government's affordable supply programme targets. Okay. You just, I think you confirmed. Nobody likes paying tax, Tony. Um, I, I, I got that flavour around the room pretty clearly. I, I, our concern um, is that housing associations do not pay it, and councils do, and okay. I don't think that was intended. If, if we started, if, the, if a government or if this committee was to recommend that um, all these areas where people are putting in well, effectively bids to have no, no taxation in this area. This tax takes in about, this particular tax took in between 16 and 19, I understand about £284 million. Uh, most of that, uh, we're, uh, and I suspect a lot of that is supporting the government's own house building programme at 50,000 homes by um, the end of this parliament. So it cuts both ways, does it not? It's, it, I, I acknowledge that the opening, my opening statement that this is a piece of special pleading. My point is that we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about unintended consequences. The officials I spoke to at the time were very clear. They had no idea that councils were involved in the acquisition of houses. They had no idea that housing associations were fully exempt from this and councils were not. It's an uneven uh, set of burdens. And these are burdens that are falling on council rents, to be clear. It's rents that pays the additional money. Housing associations do not charge their tenants for ADS because they don't have to. Local authorities are carrying additional costs. It impacts on rents and it impacts on the outputs from the affordable housing supply programme. Uh, and we do not think that was intended. Okay. Given we're on rents, um, 
uh, Daryl, uh, that's about an area you're interested in, I think. Am I right in saying that? Yes. Yeah, so would you like to just uh, flush out some of your own issues there as well? I think that would be helpful now that Tony's introduced the, the issue of rent. Thanks, Tom, sir. I'll probably cut across your question here because things are moving on, so forgive me. Um, Daryl McIntosh from Property Mark, which is the National Association of Estate Agents and ARLA Association of Residential Letting Agents. And I think our concern is, or what we notice or are noticing, is, is when you're talking about rents, is supply. Um, and the, uh, and the, the, the amount of landlords who are threatening to, um, to, to leave the sector altogether. Um, we had a recent survey done for the, um, for the, the tenancy schemes um, and they said 27% of landlords uh, were ready to, to leave the sector within five, uh, five years. Um, and it's, it's, it's increasing the rents as well. There's a lack of, uh, a lack of stock. Um, which is ultimately increasing um, rents at the moment as well. There's uh, a lack of properties. I was at a crisis meeting on Friday and they had figures that there should be 24% of the property stock as social housing. In Edinburgh, it's only 15%. So there's a, 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 a lack of properties there and then people need uh, need housed. And if it's if there's some a knock-on effect onto um, the private rented sector, uh, which, uh, as I say, it, it seems that we're having, along with all the other tax um, implications that uh, the, the landlords or second homeowners are, are are coming across it. As I say, I think that's a, an unintended consequence there as well, and, and having a knock-on effect onto the rents as well. Okay, I, I've been pushing back on quite a few folk here, so I might as well push back on you, Daryl, in that case, just because I can, <laughs> and just make sure we're, we're getting the, the right stuff on the record here. Are you saying that if the, this tax wasn't applicable to uh, in the rented sector in the way you describe it, um, that in these circumstances that your people you represent would, I won't use the word guarantee, but would look to reduce the rents if this wasn't there? You would see there would be more properties on the market, there would be more availability, there would be more choice for um, for tenants. Um, at the moment, there's some uh, some properties getting five, six, seven applicants um, for, a, you know, for a property in, in certain areas. So if there are more available properties, then, then yes, it should come, ultimately bring the rents down. Okay. Patrick. Thanks very much, convener. I'd just like to explore that a bit further. I mean, th there's, a, there's a danger that this conversation uh, drifts toward basic housing policy. You know, the, the, the significant growth of the private rented sector, significant reduction in the social rented sector over a number of decades. Uh, some people would be comfortable with that choice, others us, others would not. But this this is a discussion about one element of one tax rather than overall housing policy and, and a, a kind of discussion about how comfortable we are with the growth of the private rented sector as opposed to uh, a, a different balance of, of tenures. Uh, can any of those who are advocating for uh, for the abolition or reduction of this of this tax uh, from the private rented sector on the basis that that will benefit tenants, uh, hazard a guess as to why tenants' organisations, who are not represented around the table here today, uh, aren't uh, out campaigning for a reduction on the tax that their landlords pay. Uh, many tenants' organisations, in fact, are much more motivated to, to try and uh, take action against ongoing illegal fees and charges being paid uh, by, their, by tenants to landlords and letting agents. You know, if the, if the real desire here is to, is to reduce rents, it doesn't seem to me that a reduction on tax that's paid by landlords is going to achieve that. OK. Darrell, you want to respond to that? Um, well, I mean, I, I, see, I think just from the figures that, that, that we have, it, that more, I see there would be more landlords entering to, to the market if there was um, less tax for them to pay. And, uh, and as I say, hopefully there'd be, there'd be more and better stock for, um, for a tenant or proposed tenants. I mean, several of the of the written submissions uh, make that claim that uh, you know if if, uh, if there was more uh, in the way of private rented uh, uh, accommodation, that that's an increase in the housing stock. And if people come out of the private rented sector, that's a reduction in the housing stock. It, it clearly isn't a reduction in the housing stock. People who cease being landlords don't knock their properties down. Okay, I see that quizzical look, Patrick. Don't it, you. 
very briefly. I, 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 mean, I agree. I don't think there is any evidence that in the private rented sector this tax is pushing up rents. Uh, I think there might be some evidence that it is discouraging new investors on the buy-to-let side, but that, that's a, a wholly different uh, uh, question. And speaks to what the Scottish Government wants to achieve in terms of the market overall, and I think that's a, a, a later part of this conversation. But I think the evidence around buy-to-let investment is is made more difficult to interpret by the, all the other changes around the taxation of private rented that have taken place over the last three or four years, which, will have, which may well have had a similar dampening impact on the market. But I am told by people who know that buy-to-let investment in this city, for example, is probably now flat. Um, and the sector isn't growing, and that's that's a, a bit of a change in the way the market's been operating. How that is probably nothing to do with ADS, I think, is the, is the key point there. We're probably better getting into that wider question then, I think. And Emma, you want to kick it off? Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, we've talked about the impact of ADS on personally for people, and now drifting into uh, rental as well, but. Um, in our uh, briefing paper, it talked about the impact of tax changes should rarely, if ever, be seen in isolation. So there are many other factors which influence the markets, and ADS is no exception to this. So I'm interested to hear thoughts about the, the, what are the other contributing factors for um, for the impact on the housing market. You know, there are certain times of the year where more folk will move house or choose to buy, and. Uh, um, so there's obviously other factors that contribute, not just ADS. Yeah. And, and just to add into that question, uh, this legislation was brought in to stop distortion in the market effectively after the UK acted. And had the UK, had the Scot in Scotland been not done some, something similar, would that not have led to a situation where people from south of the border would be coming into Scotland to try to buy as many of these homes as they possibly could and create distortion in the market. So when we're having that discussion, generally, I, I throw that in as another element for push, push, push back at me on, if they want to, <laughs> please. So who would like to kick off? David. Yes, uh, just to, yes, the, I mean, the, the measure was introduced uh, swiftly after I think George Osborne uh, 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 suggest made his proposals. Um, and whether it could have led to a real distortion or not, I guess we'll never know now because it was introduced at the time. Obviously, the tax has been increased since that time recently in, in Scotland as as well. So, um, you know, we'll see what impact that has on potential buy to investors. But I think there is a wider picture here. I would agree with the fact that you shouldn't look at the, just this tax in isolation for those for its impact on the market, which was, which was raised. Uh, there have been... Uh, controls on uh, affordability for buy-to-let investors. I think buy-to-let investment has, I think, gradually fallen as a proportion of lending that's been going out. There's been the private rented bill, which obviously changed uh, the procedures for landlord and tenant, and maybe the balance of risk there uh, was shifted as well. So I think there has been a, several changes to the environment for buy-to-let landlords in particular, which had, had mushroomed, really, I think, from the 90s onwards. Uh, so yeah, I think all of those reasons are, and I'm not surprised to hear that it's now flat in terms of new buy to let investment, even in Edinburgh, which was traditionally so strong. So yeah, I think this is this is one element that is adding to, uh, I suppose, the uh, the obstacles to landlords or new landlords, at least. I suppose the question is whether if they're selling into the uh, private for sale market as, as, to, as to what the potential consequences of that is. Um, but again, you have other policies, the support for f uh, first-time buyers and so on, which will which will add to that. Mike, you're obviously here representing the Scottish Association of Landlords and the Council of Letting Agents. Do you want to reflect on some of what you've been here? Uh, yes, thanks very much, uh, Chair. Um, we, we're not um, calling for the abolition of this tax. We, we're just uh, interested in providing evidence on the impact, potential impact. Um, and I realise as a, uh, the Scottish Association of Landlords, by definition, is a landlord organisation, and every change in legislation, we, we have this concern, and it, it doesn't always play out. Um, the, um, 
I think the issue for me with ADS is the application in a uniform way right across the country from hotspot markets in Edinburgh, I would still say was a hotspot market to small town Scotland where the markets aren't as hot, that the impact is likely to be more significant uh, over the piece. Um, uh, the, the, the linkage to rents, I'm, I'm not convinced about. Um, I think we would need to look at that in some detail. We, we have lots of anecdotal evidence from our members um, uh, who we meet with regularly in, around the country. We have a branch meeting network, and uh, top of their list of concerns are the UK tax changes at the moment, rather than ne necessarily ADS. Uh, second to that would be concerns about how they're going to meet the energy efficiency measures in terms of financing them. So I think it's too early for us to dig ourselves into another position of saying that uh, private renting is going to come to an end or something like that over this issue. I, I don't... Just to, for context, because I just don't know, what, what, at Westminster, what is, what is, being, what, what is changing? Because it might mean there, the, the, there'll be a consequence for here. Cause I just sure. I mean, there'll be other people in the room that can answer that better, but essentially mor uh, mortgage tax relief uh, for buy-to-let mortgage was removed previously and, and rental income is now taxed rather than rental profit uh, that, in terms of, you know, just giving you a quick uh, kind of... Oh, that's helpful. Uh, uh, and and you'd expect that to impact on the rents as well in terms of... Uh, um, it, ultimately, it, it would if there was a, d a decrease in the stock of private rented, uh, rented stock. But I think the, the biggest impact from that is landlords leaving the sector. Now, landlords always leave a sector. Uh, the, the, you know, the landlords have a, a life cycle to a degree. So there, there will be some landlords that leave for every piece of legislation. But uh, the UK tax is the number one uh, consideration. We, we get a lot of feedback about f from accountants that their clients who have buy-to-let businesses are finding profits are tighter, uh, taxes more because of this restriction in the interest relief. There's also measures coming through on the CGT capital gains tax side, which I think will also impact uh, on the, the buy-to-let sector. So, uh, Isabel. Um, yes, just to, to reiterate that the, the UK tax changes obviously affect landlords up here as well. Um, and many landlords um, perhaps deciding that the after-tax results are not worth continuing with or alternatively incorporating because you can pay a lower tax rate if you run it through a company type of thing. Um, but uh, the, I, I guess one thing that's, that's worth just going back to in terms of why the tax was introduced, if that's okay, is I, I just wonder whether it was entirely introduced to stop landlords south of the border rushing up and buying the entire housing stock in Kirk and Tillich or wherever. Or, like or Dumfries. <laughs> yes, I suppose they'd get there first. Um, <laughs> but was it not also the case, and not, this is very complicated and I don't pretend to understand it, that if we hadn't introduced it, there would have been a kind of big hole in the finances of Scotland because of the impact of the fiscal, you know, the, yeah. That was one of the issues. Murdo is nodding sagely, so <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm pretending I'm, to I'm, understand. I'm, <laughs> either pretending to understand or... or yeah, it's the kind of you. block grant adjustment that if Westminster yeah, had a three percent. So that was one yes, of the yeah. so I think we were almost forced into it under the sort of devolution with strings arrangements. But um, the 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 thing to perhaps bear in mind though is that the devolved taxes are here to stay, and other things like that are going to happen. So when we're we're sort of asking for um, diff perhaps different procedures. We're going to have to keep reacting to what's going on, either in Westminster in relation to SDLT or in relation to other taxes. Tony, I'm coming to you. Yeah, just a couple of points. I think the point about the impact on individual landlords is, is important. Most landlords own their properties and rent them out on a personal basis rather than on a business basis. So uh, taking the full rental income into 
uh, consideration for tax purposes often pushes them into a higher tax band, which is one of the impacts that is promoting or, or pushing folk towards incorporation, setting up businesses. To, um, to the extent that that is driving a professionalisation uh, and discouraging amateurs, then we would regard that as a good thing, but I don't think there's any evidence on that at all. I, I also always thought the argument that there would be large numbers of buyers from the south moving north uh, to be... Uh, uh, spurious, let's be honest. I think I think renting in, in the Scottish context, if you're used to the English legal system, would be quite tough, and translating up here would be quite tough too, and I don't think there was any evidence that that would happen. But the other objective of this measure was to protect market space for first-time buyers, uh, and that was stated in, in the policy note around it. My understanding is there is some evidence that first-time buyers have returned to the housing market in Scotland uh, in, in numbers over the last uh, a um, year or so, two years or so, how much of that is down to ADS is another matter. But there is some evidence that first-time buyers are now more strongly represented, certainly in the mortgage market. I'm not sure. Is any, have you got any information, Elaine, that could, in terms of... Not with me today. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, there's a first-time buyer. There's changes to the legislation to encourage first-time buyers. Um, we'll have information within the office in relation to that. If it's useful to the committee, we okay. could send that in. Thank you. Emma? We supplement since the word Dumfries was mentioned. <laughs> um, there is a big variation of prices of houses in, in Scotland. So in Edinburgh, you can buy a house for £280,000, whereas the equivalent property bill will be about 121000 in Dumfries and about 130000 in Ayr. So does the wide difference in property value across Scotland impact where where um, landlords might choose to purchase, like in Kirkubri, for instance, or something like that. Mike, you want to have a go at that? Um, oh, sorry. Did you, you, uh, some, uh, oh, come on over to my All right, okay. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, uh, we have, a, a, if, if we can uh, uh, use our letting agency business, which is in Falkirk, uh, for, for an illustration, the rents were always low and stable. Um, and that fitted in with uh, the uh, average wage in the area and so forth. And uh, so when buy-to-let investors were buying property, they were at market prices, which were sensible prices. Um, in, Ed in Edinburgh, to contrast that, and lots of small towns will be like that. Um, in uh, and, and the thing about the the 4%, although in, in uh, pound note terms, 4% of a property in Edinburgh is going to be higher than 4% of a property in Falkirk on balance, um, that 4% has a greater kind of uh, impact in a, in a small town market, proportionately in terms of the price to the average in the market, adding 4% on. But um, uh, there, there, uh, there are lots of uh, buoyant PRS markets in, in every small town across Scotland that function perfectly well uh, and, uh, you know, do a good job, so... Mm. OK, listen, does anybody want to raise any points that have not come out so far? I've got a couple of questions I still want to ask, but not, it, t it takes us back a bit. So is there any other issues that any of the representatives around the table want to make sure that they have the chance to tell us in terms of this evidence-taking session? Ross? Now, my report, and I know I'm, I'm beating the drum for the small builder here, but just it was just it was just one point on the ADS. There is a relief available um, if there's a purchase of six or more properties. If they're purchased, I think either separate or as a linked transaction. If I've picked up that legislation correctly, so again, it was really just to highlight that that's um, disadvantaging the the, the the smaller builder. If you buy six so or more, you'll, right. you'll you'll get relief from the, the ADS. There is there's obviously something in there. Sorry, just yep. for the record, it doesn't apply if it's in linked transactions. It has to be part of a single transaction. Sorry, so I thought I read that there was a, a if, it, if there was a linked transaction, it did apply. Um, it's it's if it's six or more as part of a, a single transaction that it applies to. Does everybody else agree? <laughs> you don't want to don the record wrong. Um. So, <laughs> so. I think there's a bit of a mistake single transaction hasn't been defined in the legislation. Yes. Um, so whether it could have different completion dates or not, but I agree. That Link transactions is a, is a sort of technical yeah. term, which means any transaction yeah. between the same seller and purchaser or persons connected with them. A single transaction is, is well, as, as Joe says, not defined, but it's kind of a bit like an elephant. You know, you can recognize it so if you're buying six at once and it's the same deal then you then um there's no ads 
but it doesn't work across linked transactions. That, that will see if he didn't develop it, any lawyers' costs now. That you're <laughs> <to us>. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to get complaints from his, who his lawyers are as well. Listen, I've got a question to ask in terms of what's happening at Westminster. These are obviously anomalies that are being picked up here, but there'll be people here uh, who are also involved in a, in, a, in a UK or have a, a UK perspective in terms of these anomalies. And how are they being addressed at Westminster? Is it, are they being taken forward in any in a finance bill? Are they being taken forward um, in, in any per, any process? Because these th same things must be happening to the same leg the same legislation south of the border. Or border, I thought. Has anyone got any knowledge of that? Yeah. Uh, so, some of them, I'm sure um, Joe can comment also. Some of the uh, similar issues have been addressed in. Um, legislation, so the granny flat um, exemption or relief or whatever you want to call it was introduced into the um, higher rates of additional dwellings for SDLT through a finance bill. Um, some of the issues are also trying to be addressed through um, improve, improvements to the guidance or looking at other ways of um, framing guidance. And the Welsh Revenue Authority, for example, which isn't clearly Westminster, but an, another tax authority um, we, we can pay attention to have a, or are trying to design an interactive tool which will help taxpayers, you know, put things in and it'll ask other questions and hopefully throw out the same answer. So that that's a sort of trying to deal with it through guidance and so on. But a lot of the perceived anomalies, well, with, with HRAD, I think have, have would have been ad addressed through the annual finance bill process by being raised by stakeholders and discussed with HMRC and and, and so on. Do you want to reflect on that? Yeah, no, just, just to agree, really, that, that they have kind of been raised more as we've gone along, the, the issues there. Um, it has been obviously harder over the last, I guess, 12 months to get anything um, changed at all just because the government's been otherwise engaged but um yeah in terms of the the level of complexity and the number of queries we're seeing for um taxpayers south of the border i'd say i see a similar number there are you know we do have the sim same issues um with people accidentally falling into that uh, additional dwelling supplement for sdlt as we do for for lbct as well but, sorry. Yeah, you go. I, I think the um the, the point about the Westminster process is that because of the annual finance bill mechanism, it's a lot easier to get things changed. So the granny flat, I think, was thought of um, at a, a fairly... I, I can't remember exactly when, but it's quite easy to get it put in and to the legislation because there is the, that process. And if you can't get it in one year's finance bill, it can go into the next year. OK. I think that's been quite helpful, understanding what the anomalies are, wh where the tensions are in this, uh, in, in, in the EDS process. I, I suspect that the committee will want to agree to, to have a, an evidence taking session with the, with the minister responsible for this, and that will give us a chance at that, um, at that evidence taking session with the minister to probe some of these questions with he or she, because I can't remember which, which minister it is. Um, and and uh, thank you very much for coming along today and helping us in deliberations. We're very grateful. And I close this meeting of the Finance Committee.